I, I think it's hard for us to imagine when we see Rice today with the campus of, I don't know, 70 or 80 buildings and magnificent oak trees and here in this house surrounded by oak trees, it's hard to imagine what this place must have looked like in 1907, 1908 when the property was bought. But I want us to try to, to try to move back in time and imagine what the trustees thought they were doing and what they attempted to do and what Lovett did at the very beginning of this century. I think you all know the story of William Marsh Rice who you know, came here from 1837 from Massachusetts and subsequently made a fortune and uh, established in 1891 something called the, the William Marsh Rice Institute for the Advancement of Literature, Science and Art, saying nothing was to be done until he died. And he just kept on making money and living. And you all know the story how he was murdered. And so in 1900, he's dead. And so the trustees that he had put together in 1891 to, to, in some sense, supervise the building of this institute, all of a sudden had the opportunity and the challenge to make real what was sort of a paper institute. And I don't think they really understood the amount of money that was involved. They knew he was a wealthy man. They didn't quite know how wealthy. After his death, the money becomes little about 1904, 1905, and it's about seven million dollars. It's, it's one of the sixth or seventh largest endowment in the nation. Now the trustees must have thought, oh, this, is, this is a huge opportunity. The potential is too great not to do it right. But how to do it right? They were not academicians. They didn't have a lot of experience. They had already begun teaching themselves by early 1900 by riding around to various law firms asking about how do you organize such an institution? Uh, what, what are your purposes? And they began to, they realized they need to find what they call a young man who would be the head of this institute. And they began to write letters to the presidents of the major American universities and to politicians and Supreme Court judges and so forth asking what are the characteristics we should look for in the head of this new institution. And if you have somebody you'd recommend, recommend them. Well, in 1907, they, they sent these letters out. And they happened to send a letter to the, the new president of Princeton, Woodrow Wilson. And this letter basically says, we are an institute in Texas, we have a lot of money, we have a vague charter, we've got trustees who don't quite know what to do. Uh, this is an incredible opportunity. We need somebody with energy and insight and youth to sort of shape this institution. The instant he got that letter, he got it in January, he seems not to, to sort of actually read it until March. Woodrow Wilson knew who to bring, who to send it to. He forwarded that letter with a very nice handwritten note to a young mathematician who at the time was chairman of astronomy at Princeton, Edgar Odell Lovett. And Lovett wrote back in a very personal letter, says, you know, your letter brought tears to my eyes because I knew that when you recommended me, chances are they would interview me. Sure enough, on April 10, Lovett arrives in Houston at midnight to be interviewed. And they interviewed Lovett, a very, very long interview the next day. Lovett said in 1941, thinking back, that the toughest exam he ever had was that interview. But he actually gave as good as he took. I mean, they asked him questions, he asked them hard questions. He had a really nice situation. He was professor of astronomy at Princeton. He had a house on the campus. He had an observatory in the backyard. And he was raising money to build an observatory in the southern hemisphere. So he was not looking for a job. And so he pushed them to sort of think more about this university, this institute. He really pushed them to think of a university, not some sort of polytechnic institution. But at the end of that long interview, he rode the train back to, to uh, New Jersey, telling his wife, well, he didn't know if he'd get it. It was a great adventure. And for the next few months, he kept writing his letter, his wife, sort of secret letters, no word from the South, still no word from Texas. In, in December, the board asked William Marsh Rice Jr., Will Rice, to go to New York and to offer the job to Edgar Odell Lovett. Lovett thought about it. He wanted to make sure he did the right thing vis-a-vis -vis Princeton. And he finally accepted the Rice job on January 18, 1908. Well, here's this young Lovett who at 37 knows Johns Hopkins, the first research university. He knows Chicago, the first instant great university. He's got experience working hand in hand with Wilson at this really creative Princeton. And he's got two PhDs. And he has a person, if you read the letters and the correspondence, he's a person who had a kind of a sweetness of character, who had just simply had charisma and the board hired him. He came down in March 1908 after being hired for his first, first board meeting, and the board did, I think, an incredibly creative thing. They said, hire yourself a private secretary and take a trip around the world. Work out an itinerary 
We want you to go to the best places in the world to interview faculty, to look at libraries, to investigate laboratories, to get what I call a kind of an inspired idea of what one could do if you had a lot of money and a blank check charter and just had ambition. And so Lovett and a young secretary named Carrington Weems and his wife set forth in July on this incredible nine-month trip around the world. And you can follow in his day book every day where he goes, who he talks to, the notes he makes about the buildings and the laboratories and so forth. And he, he sort of piques the world's curiosity about this incredible university that's be going to be established in a place that most people in the world thought was sort of beyond civilization, Texas. <laughs> so when Lovett comes back from his trip, he has been begun to visual, visualize what could be established. And he actually sort of draws up an ideal faculty developed in all the different professors and social professors and system professors by rank and by, and by discipline. And he's imagining a great university. And he's he, he is himself inspired on this trip not to think little. And so he comes back and he convinces the board that we should establish not some provincial college, not some little technical institute, but that we should establish a real university, a university that has incredible ambition. We should at this time, he says, have no upper limit to our educational endeavor. And he begins to talk about we need to, hire, to have an absolutely first-rate architecture. We need to get the best faculty we can get. We need to get students. We need to set absolutely high standards. The, and the board buys this completely. So then he begins to deal with an architect. And he hires, after a lot of thought, he hires Ralph Adams Crown who had designed much of Princeton and West Point and a number of beautiful churches in the United States. And, and Cram begins to visualize a campus that, that picked up a whole series of stylistic uh, ideas from the Mediterranean. And then Lovett begins to realize that how important it was to have a plan that laid out a system of buildings that would be fulfilled over a 70 or 80 or 100 year period. You look at that pl architectural plan, and there, there's a place for a graduate college, there's a place for a medical school, but for a, a law school. It's a, it's a plan that, could be, that would take generations to build out, but it sort of suggests the kind of open-endedness to love its vision. And that you build the original buildings with such, a, such quality that you, in some sense, make sure the university will continue to build quality buildings. And then he realized you've got to have faculty. So he had already begun to, to, to write letters to people all over the United States, to scholars at the great universities, asking for what he called first-rate men, or young men who you think will become first-rate men. And again, he had been told, you'll have to hire southern faculty, because this is a southern university. But Lovett didn't believe that. He was from Ohio. He had been teaching at Princeton. Two of the six board members were European, one from Switzerland, one from England. So there was nothing that was provincial about the board, and there was nothing provincial about their choice of Lovett. I mean, they clearly had in mind a sort of a world university, and Lovett epitomized that. So he began to talk to faculty, you know, who, who were at, at Oxford and at Cambridge and at you know, Harvard and at Stanford. I mean, he began to sort of seek the absolute best faculty he could find. And that original faculty is just sort of stunning in quality. And then he has to get students. I mean, you need buildings, you need faculty, you need students. So in 1911, 1912, he was giving talks all over Houston. Every high school commencement address, it seems like, he gave. And he, everything was to come together and classes were to open on September 23, 1912, 12 years to the day since the murder of William Marsh Rice in his apartment building in Manhattan. And at that meeting, at that opening, on a beautiful sunny blue day in 1912, a cold front had come through and it was surprisingly cool and not very humid. Only 55 students showed up the first day. Another 20 or so came in the first three or four days later. And Lovett met those students. And he says, if you believe in reason, and beauty and your fellow men and the possibility of teaching and the possibility of learning we can here create a great university that was the opening class at rice but that was not the real final opening about a month later on october 10 11 12 lovett had imagined a huge three-day convocation at which scholars nobel prize winners people of incredible renown from all over the world were brought here to give speeches and there were delegates from all the leading american universities came here and in three spectacular days, there was sort of a summit of the mind here, that, that, uh, an event of just stunning significance. Lovett had sent all over the world these spectacular invitations about this big on parchment that were sent rolled up 
in wooden shellac tubes. And people, you can imagine all the world opening these wooden tubes, and there was this incredible invitation to come to the opening. And when they got here, the, 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 the uh, program was also about this big, printed in lambskin skin with a beautiful embossed title. And it was a series of lectures and concerts and poems that, again, I think was unrivaled in the South at that time and has never actually been met against since that time in Houston. And the final day of that event, Lovett gave a talk, very long talk, called The Meaning of the New Institution. He talked about all these phrases you've heard of. You know, again, I've already quoted this thing, no upper limit to our educational endeavor. Put brains for four bricks. Uh, have the, you know, he talked about the privilege of research and the pleasures of teaching. I mean, it's, it's a, he talks about the graduate program. He talks about the honor system. He talks about the college system. He talks about keeping sports in balance. With, he wants intramural sports to be very important too. I mean, it's an, it's an incredible document filled with vision. But even with an endowment as big as it was, he understood in 1912 you couldn't be a full-fledged total university. It's a kind of a promise of what was to happen. But he fully understood that as the city grew and as the university grew in stature, that more endowment would come in, more students would come in, you would develop eventual additional programs. So there was always a sense that Rice, as it was established, was not the final point. And the, the history of Rice since then is is the fulfillment of that plan. I mean, it's true they began around around the money in the 1920s, and there were very tough financial times in the 1930s. They actually had to cut back the number of faculty. There was a, a reduction in faculty salaries. They had to reduce the number of students. And for about 15, 12, 15 years, Rice almost hibernated, but Lovett never gave up the vision. He always held out the ideal that even in tough times, we aspire to greatness. During the 1940s, Rice began to get more money. William Marsh Rice, Will Rice, died and left $2 million. Oil was discovered on land that William Marsh Rice had bought in Louisiana. Then they made a complicated deal to buy a significant portion of Rincon oil field that's going to bring them you know, tens of millions of dollars over the next 30 or 40 years. So all of a sudden, after 10 or 15 years of tough times, by 1944, early 45, the board was beginning to see that things were happening. And the board was also very aware that the city of Houston had grown tremendously during World War II in population and in the complexity of its industry. So with more money and an enlarged, more exciting city, the board began to make plans for picking up this vision of Lovett and taking the next step. And they very explicitly said the size and the significance of Houston means that we have to expand the university. So in, in July of 1945, the board came out with a very uh, expansive 12-point plan that called for, as soon as the war was over, hire more faculty, pay better wages, increase the size of the student body, uh, build new buildings, in some sense pick up that sort of theme laid out in 1912 and begin to make it real. And I think just as important to Rice's history and tradition as that kind of founding vision has been this sense that Rice is always a university in flux, that in some sense transition is the key to Rice. I want to read a little quote here that, that uh, Lovett said. In 1946, he introduced the next Rice president, William Houston, to the, to the students and to the alums at the 1946 commencement exercises. And this is what he said. Rice is in a state of transition. It's at a transition from good to better. Facing extraordinary opportunity, the institution is about to become braver, stronger, sounder, and more beautiful. I mean, that's a vibrant conception of a university. And I think if we really want to sort of live up to the Rice tradition, it's this sense of enhancement. It's sort of this openness to the adventure of new opportunities that is key to Rice. I mean, think of what happened in the 50 years after Lovett. After the 1940s, there's a surge of building, Fundren Library, Abercrombie, Anderson Hall. There's going to be another surge of building in the mid-1950s. You know, Keith Weiss, the biological laboratories and so forth, Hammond Hall, the, uh, the geological laboratories, the RMC. And something that Lovett had planned at the very beginning, we make additions to three of the old dorms. We already had 1950, what was called Weiss Hall. Then they built Jones College. All of a sudden, 1957, finally, the college system comes into being. So that was a tremendous change 
in the 1950s. In 1960, the university really changes its name to university because it had become a university. Then the decade of the 1960s is an is a era of really a transformative change. In 1960, there were 1,600 Rice undergraduates. In 1970, there were more than 2,400. The student body increased by more than 50% in the decade of the 1960s. But enough faculty was hired that the student-faculty ratio fell. New programs were developed. The schools of humanities and social science were developed. In the 1970s, the, the business school was established. The music school was established. In the 1980s, we again, we again, we sort of picked up this sense of ambition. We began to even emphasize more than we ever had before the importance of interdisciplinary research and all kinds of interdisciplinary institutes that took advantage of our small size and sometimes made our small size into an advantage and made us realize the importance of reaching out to other institutions. In the 1980s, we became even more aware of how significant it was, how necessary it was to internationalize the university. And all, through all these decades, we've added new buildings. The undergraduate population has moved up to about 2,800. The graduate enrollment, until 1946, we'd only offered one PhD outside of sciences. That was one in history in the mid-30s. And until 1946, PhDs were offered only in biology, chemistry, physics, and mathematics. By 1950, the graduate program had doubled. It doubled again by 1970. It's doubled again since then. So the history of Rice is the history of a university with a marvelous beginning, a kind of a vision of excellence, a kind of an openness to seizing opportunity, a recognition that as the city grew and changed, the university had to grow into change. So we are now nearing the end of the first century. 2012 is the centennial of the founding of Rice. And I think if you're really true to Rice, if we're really true to the real Rice heritage, if we're true to love it, we ought to do everything we possibly can in the next few years to make absolutely certain that by 2012, we have become the university that Lovett envisioned in 1912. And that even more, we should use that time to sort of imagine bold new plans for the next century. And I think if we do anything less, we're not really being true to Lovett's vision of Rice University. Thanks very much.